So good to have you back again. It means a lot to me personally that you take the time to personally join with me in my morning devotions here at the Christ Jesus Chapel in the Christ Jesus College and Seminary. For me personally, I have come to a greater understanding and appreciation of who God is and what God should mean to us. And there are many things in my life that were, at least at the time, I considered very important and I spent a lot of time and energy trying to, to seek and fulfill those goals. I've come to a point in my life where I understand that the absolute truth of God is crystal clear. If you really want to be someone who knows Jesus Christ and he knows you and you're truly in the process of denying yourself, carrying your cross, and following him, not a pastor, not a church, not a denomination. Remember, the, the, the church of Christ is one body. It was never God's intention. It was never the the motivation of Christ that the body of Christ would be fractionated into all these denominations that seem to be competitive. They appear to be distinct. Yet they all have one common denominator, Christ crucified. The failure among the churches today is that they're not teaching they're not preaching, they're not proclaiming, they're not publishing, they're not committed in their souls. And they're not putting their money where their mouth is with regards to publishing and proclaiming the gospel. What is the gospel? The good news. We have all been born into original sin. That is not my words, Those that these are the sound doctrines of the Bible found both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and Jesus makes it very clear. No man has ever seen God. No man can ever enter the presence of God, except he goes through the gate, except he goes through the door, except he comes to the point in his life where he understands that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, how so easy it is to say those words. But oh, how difficult it is to really manifest that type of life and that attitude in our lives. I, I say this with profound... I say this with profound gravity. Do not underestimate what I'm saying to you. I'm merely a messenger. I'm merely a vessel. I'm merely an instrument. Don't look at me at all. I have nothing to offer to anyone, above all to myself. But the message that I say to you is coming directly from the Holy Spirit. The message I share with you is directly from Christ himself. So maybe the envelope looks old and wrinkled. Maybe you may look at me and say, well, he's a nice fellow, interesting message. Do not underestimate the message that I'm sharing, especially today's message. Because when you open this wrinkled envelope and you look at this princely, godly letter, with the stamp of God upon it, you will realize this is a direct telegram from God to you, to us. I'm very thankful to the Bible scholars who helped me put this 
message together. This is actually a group. One of the first times one of my sermons was developed by a, a group of the Bible scholars. I want to express my thanks. I'm seeing more and more cooperation and love among the Bible scholars and the chapel and the, the Bible college. And again, I personally invite you to click and subscribe. You have absolutely nothing to lose. You could always unsubscribe anytime you want. Because by clicking that notification bell, you're going to see content that, that has been developed over the past year and a half literally explode before your very eyes. We're not fooling around about proclaiming the gospel. And we're going to be on other platforms. You're going to be hearing different announcements very shortly. Time is short, and the Bible says... The evening is here. The darkness is here. The daylight is about to abate. Let us put away our works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. This is very sound advice, my friends, because we're seeing biblical prophecies unfurl literally every nanosecond of the day. The drum roll, the drum roll is intensifying. And the question is, The question is, are you listening? Are you paying attention? It's so easy to be distracted by so many little things in life that are completely meaningless. In the light of eternity, when we look back at all these little things, the comments we make, the things we're concerned about, the things that upset us, the things that possess our mind, the meaningless they fall totally in the content of what Solomon said. Vanity, oh vanities. It's, it's, it's meaningless. And yet we spend our entire life, sometimes a year, sometimes a decade, and for those of us who are unfortunately foolish enough, an entire lifetime pursuing nothing. We were pursuing nothing. There was zero sum. sum return, there were no compound dividends spiritually on what we pursued. And oh, yes, each one of us is plagued by pride. Each one of us is plagued by arrogance. Each one of us is plagued by a tongue that is uncontrolled. And we all do a lie. We are all liars. Each one of us. We lie to ourselves. We lie to others. And worst of all, we lie to God. May we be in a very repentive spirit at this very moment. Above all, included myself. I ask God for forgiveness. I tell God of my mortality, and he reminds me of my immortality. I remind myself that I'm a sinner, and he reminds me that I'm a saint. And so God expects far more from me than I expect from myself. And so this message... Someone yesterday asked, could you please repeat the commentary you made regarding the banks and the money? Now, I'll be very honest with you that this quote here that I read yesterday, and I'm more than happy to read it because it's going to be the prelude to the message of money, money, money. These are not my words. These were words that were read in the English Parliament not too long ago by a very angry member of the parliament regarding money, regarding the banks, regarding what the governments and the banks are doing and have been doing. And if, and if you don't recall what happened in 2000 and 2009, it was a huge blimp on the economic worldwide scale where the banks unloaded their debt on the public and got away with it. And it's going to happen again. That was just that was just a trial. That was just a test to see if they can do it, how far they can get away with it. Let me read this again, and then allow me to read what Scripture has to say about this subject. So are we ready? Of course you are. 
says here, and this is, again, a quote from one of the members of the parliament in England. And you can find this on the internet. It says, all banks are broke. I'm going to repeat this. All banks around the world are broke because of something called fractional reserve banking. You don't hear this on the media or on the tube. Banks lend out money that they don't actually have. This is called quantitative easing. It's a Ponzi scheme. It's a worldwide criminal phenomena. It's a criminal scandal on the international basis. It's called counterfeiting. That is the artificial printing of money. If any other ordinary person would counterfeit money, that individual person would go to jail. But he says here in his quote that the governments and the banks and the bankers and these financial individuals we called wizards somehow are above the law. He says governments and banks repress the interest rates at the banks. Now you think about that. He says we deposit our money in the banks, and we are led to believe that there are deposit guarantees. Your money is guaranteed. If anything were to happen to the world or to the country, that money in the bank is guaranteed to be given back to you. Is that true? Is that true? That if you were to put $100,000 in a bank and some world catastrophe would happen, that you're guaranteed to get that $100,000 back again? He goes on to say, so when banks go broke because of their pure, unadulterated theft of the taxpayers, what do the governments and the banks and the lawmakers allow? The debt of the banks now filtered down to the public and the taxpayers pay the tab. This is exactly what happened in 2008 and 2009. And my friends, we are quickly approaching a much larger financial earthquake. Yes, you heard it here in this channel. I'm no financial wizard, but I can tell you what the Bible says. There's going to be a great falling away. There's going to be a great rebellion. People are going to come to a point where they just said, I had enough of big government, big corporations. They say there's law and order, but there's not. The church has disappointed us. The government has disappointed us. I've lost everything. I've lost my health. I've lost my money. There's going to be a great rebellion. Let me tell you what the scripture says. Someone, and that's a very interesting word, that in Matthew, it would say someone. This really could be anybody. Someone came to Jesus. What a wonderful opportunity that someone actually saw Jesus, actually came and spoke with him. It's being recorded here. It says, someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good deed, you must circle the word good, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Jesus replied, why ask me what is good? There's only one good. You see, the word good comes from the word God. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, ah, eternal life. See, there's life here on earth. We are destined to be born. We do all have an appointment to die, and yet there's still yet another life beyond that that is far more important, yet people don't pay attention to it. 
the more concerned about their bank, their taxes, and their financial portfolio. If you want to receive eternal life, then keep the commandments. The young man asked, which ones? And Jesus replied, you must not murder. Well, he said, well, I never murdered anybody. I just had a couple of abortions. Well, you think about that. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. Well, I never committed adultery. I just watch porn. You think about that. You must not steal. Stealing comes at many levels. Plagiarism is stealing. You must not testify falsely. Well, I, I've never got a court and perjured myself. Many people perjure themselves. And many people tell lies. We are all liars. Honor your father and mother. We know in the last days that men and women will not honor their mother and fathers and throw them in nursing homes and do whatever they want to do so they can enjoy their life because they say, we're here to celebrate life. We don't celebrate death. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now remember, love your neighbor as yourself changes at the New Covenant, at the Last Supper, and Jesus changes this, this word, this sentence, to love others as I have loved you. So it geometrically, exponentially, is changed to a much higher level. But at this, at this juncture in, in the life of Jesus, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's hard as it is enough people are so in love with themselves just look at the amount of people with cosmetic surgery and changing their and, and doing hair plugs and botoxing their lips trying to have eternal youth and just rather than accepting themselves as they are and trusting in the promises that god will change us we'll all be movie stars in heaven why waste your time trying to do it here on earth? The Bible says, I have, I have obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? As it says in, in Hamlet, here's the rub. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Wow. I'm sure they teach that at Wharton's. I'm sure when you get your, BA, your, your MBA at Harvard, that's something that that's one of the principles they teach. Sell all you have, give it to the poor. You look at, look at a man like Gandhi and Mandela and Martin Luther King and many others. And I'm not saying that they're the most perfect examples. But there's something, to be, there's something to be said about having less and enjoying more. You will have treasure in heaven. Hmm. Those are very two distinct choices. Hang on to the moolah or have an eternal reward in heaven, a treasure in heaven. Choose door A or choose door B. If you notice that most of the Christians... The apostles, they lived lives of poverty, simplicity. There was a scarcity in their life, but spiritually, their spiritual level of power was far beyond what we are experiencing today because we are now oversaturated with materialism. We call it capitalism. We call it laissez fair. We call it the American dream. You call it whatever you like, but whatever it is, it has overshadowed what happened early on in the books of Acts where Christians said, it's not mine, it's thine. He says, sell all you have and fall... And, and you'll have great treasure in heaven. And then, then come follow me. 
I really can't say how many Christians in the world are really following Christ. That will be de- that will be determined at the right place at the right time. But in this particular story, but when the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to the disciples, I tell you the truth. It is very hard. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I can stop right now and that would be a wonderful message. Jesus is saying to his disciples, I will tell you the truth. It is very hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And you have to understand here in verse 24, he says something again. It's very, very important. You could easily miss it. He says, I say it again. He's repeating it. You have to understand that when, when you're in the Bible and something is being repeated, there's a purpose for that repetition. It's to inundate you with something that's very critical. I say it again. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And there's been a lot of debate about the camel and the eye of the needle. I'll give you my interpretation. You could do your own research. I think it's literal. I think he actually meant taking a camel and putting it through the eye of a needle. Yes, it's true that at that time, the walls of Jerusalem did have certain little gaps, little holes in their wall, so that when the gates closed at night for security, if people that were traveling were trying to enter Jerusalem at nighttime, the only way the camel could enter through this little gaping hole in the walls of Jerusalem was to unload the wealth, unload the goods, unload the fare off the backs of the camel, and the camel would have to go on its hoofs and crawl and squeeze through that hole. But it couldn't, it could, he, it couldn't be both. It couldn't be the camel and the wealth, just the camel itself. So perhaps both are true. Jesus takes it a step further. You need to hear this because there's going to be a time where we may all have nothing. We may all be facing persecution and we may all be facing very dire circumstances where what we had, we do not have. And we need to listen very carefully to what Jesus is saying to us. No man can serve two masters. And I can tell you right now, Maybe God has allowed this poor sinner. I am just, I am just a, a poor sinner who has been given unmerited favor to be sitting on a mountaintop looking about the other churches and other pastors and being, being given a glimpse, a peep down the corridor, a, a different insight so I can understand a little bit more differently so I can come as a poor poet and a poor prophet to warn and to and to disciple and to help us to 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 decipher what's about to happen. Something big is coming our way, and what Jesus is saying here is, you cannot serve two masters, for either you'll hate one and love the other. Did you hear that? You either hate Jesus and love your money. Or you'll hate your money and you'll love Jesus, but you can't have it both. And I will tell you right now, in my counseling and my interaction as an archbishop, as a doctor, among many, many, many people of great wealth, great education, and all the common folk, this is a persistent and consistent issue in all of our lives, including myself. It says, or else... He will hold to one and despise the other. And again, to show the importance of the statement, Jesus repeats it again. 
you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot. It's impossible. And I think especially for those of us who are living in the Western Hemisphere, and especially in America, this is a chronic issue in the church, in the community, in the family, and in your life and in mine. How do I close here? Who's mammon? Look it up. It's a Syrian deity. You see, Satan and his wonderful power of organization and efficiency, he's a wonderful businessman. He's got a Ponzi scheme. He's got a corporation that is literally all across the earth, above in the air. And he has delegated to each of his demons that all been outcasted. The clock is ticking, tick, tock, tick, tock, and their judgment is coming, and they have nothing to lose. And it's all out warfare. Demons, spirits without bodies, and they hate you. If you're not saved, they still hate you because you're the image of God. But if you were if you were wise enough to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, then you are a prime target. And if they can't get you, they'll get your wife. They can't get your wife, they'll get your kids. They can't get your kids, they'll go after your wealth. They are going to come after you. That's why Ephesians 6 and wearing the armor is so important. If you wake up in the morning without wearing your spiritual armor, you are a fool. Those are not my words. The word mammon is so important. It is found in Hebrew, Latin, Greek, and Aramaic. You think about that. It is defined as earthly goods, property, and riches. The Bible defines it. That mammon are the things of this world that divert our attention from God to the pleasures and comforts of earthly desires. I repeat that. It will divert your attention. You should be focusing and gazing into the eyes of Jesus and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit to be like Ananias, to go heal and encourage a fallen soul who will become a Paul. But you won't do it because you are, di you are diverted your attention is diverted to the pleasures and the comfort of earthly desires. Money, money, money. I fight for it. I live for it. I breathe for it. I eat for it. I will kill for it. That's the world we live in today. Yes, money can provide fleeting happiness, but ultimately it is a deadly distraction. I warn you, Money is a deadly distraction for the salvation of our souls. Paul ends it like this. Thank God for Paul. I thank God that God gave us a Paul who could write these words for us at this particular time because it's very pertinent and salient that we, we capture this truth, we integrate it, and, to, and we assimilate it into our lives because it's going to be a reality sooner than you think there is a world agenda and they want everything they want the land for the farms they want your money they want your dna they want your soul and they're going to do anything it isn't them don't get mad at the people they're just puppets it's the enemy that's behind them that's using them all these people, these players on, on the stage of life that we look on television, they're all victims. Pray for them. Pray for your worldly leaders. Pray for the people who persecute you. Pray for the people who misunderstand, who misjudge your Christian walk. They're victims. The true predators are the ones that are behind them spiritually who are using them, who have possessed their mind and bodies because they're using money as the ultimate bait to capture you. 1 Timothy 6. But godliness with contentment 
is great gain. Do you hear that? To be godly, to be holy, and to be content with what you have is great gain. I don't need another house. I don't need another car. I don't need another IRA. In fact, the less I have, the better. Because then instead of me worrying about those things, I have more time to serve the master. For it says we are brought into this world with nothing, and it is completely certain that you will carry nothing out. When they buried Napoleon, his last request was, bury me with my hand outside of the grave. Leave my hand out into nature itself to show everyone. Yes, I was Napoleon. Yes, I won 60 battles in a row. I almost conquered the world, but I left empty-handed. It says verse 8, and having food and raiment, just to have enough food for the day and having enough clothes, let us therewith be content. Now listen to, listen very carefully to these last words. I know I'm slightly over time here, but you know what? This is where the two-minute warning comes in. Don't miss this. But, verse 9, but they that will be rich, those people who are insisting to be rich, those people who are running and they're pursuing, and they're just consumed with this idea that I must be rich, I must have it, I need it, I will take it at whatever cost. There's a price. There are consequences for this decision. And as Christians, if we are to be called by the name of Christ, if we are going to have that privilege to be called Christian, that we have Christ living within us. This is a privilege. This is the highest honor. This is better than the Nobel Peace Prize and the Academy Award and all the world can ever give you for someone to call you a Christian. If you're going to pursue money, and let me be honest with my confession, there was a time in my life that I pursued a career of medicine thinking that fame, fortune, and glory, and money was the end game. And then Jesus asked you a question. What's better, all of this or one hour with me? Yeah, I heard his voice. And said, oh, Lord, one hour with you is so much more better. What happens to these people who persist in following riches? They will fall into temptation. Warning, Christian, you pursue wealth, you pursue money, you insist on grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit in the pursuit of money, you will fall into temptation. It will be like a pit, and it will be like a snare. You will fall into the pit, and it will be like a snare grasping you. You know how they catch the monkeys? There are some very exotic monkeys that are found in many zoos, and you wonder, they're so beautiful, they're so limber, they're so fast, how do they catch them? It's a very simple trick. They love coconuts. And so they get these coconuts, and they tie a rope to these coconuts, and they put inside the coconuts all these wonderfully colored stones. And the monkeys come, and they look, and they hope to eat the coconut, and they jiggle the coconut, and they see, and they look inside the coconut, and they see these wonderful, color, colorful stones, and they put their hand inside a small little hole, and they grab onto the stones. They want that colorful red, blue, and white stone. But they can't get their hand out. And now the trappers now simply, slowly pull in the rope, and the monkey's being dragged in, losing its freedom, and now headed, is headed its way now to a prison called the zoo. And you would think that the monkey would be smart enough to say, let me go, let me, let me, let me let go with these silly little rocks and get my freedom, but they don't. They go all the way, and they get captured. And this is what happens to the Christians. We're hanging on to nothing, and we lose our freedom. You will fall into a temptation. You will fall into a snare. 
and you will fall into many foolish and hurtful lusts and it will throw you down and there will be destruction and perdition it will destroy you the pursuit of money will destroy you we take it a step further this is the next verse for the love of money is the root of all evil which some have coveted have lusted they've made an they've made this a, an idolatry they have the the they have the brazen they have the brazen audacity to say oh how i love jesus and yet in their heart they're just burning with a fire for the money they have erred from the faith that's the truth they have erred from the faith and they have pierced themselves they have pierced themselves they have self-inflicted wounds with many with many sorrows you see this money this wealth, this possession, this worship of mammon is going to bring you perdition, destruction, and sorrows. You've been patient with me here, so just one more verse. What's the answer? As the big trouble is coming, and it is coming, I warn you, you heard it here. The big trouble is coming, and it is far more intense and more profound and far more graphic than you can imagine. It's coming. Food will be scarce. Everyone will be monitored. There's going to be a force that is going to be so brazen against Christ. There'll be not mandates not only for the Jags, but there'll be mandates about putting a mark upon you or you will not buy or sell, and you're going to face great hardships. Some will die, and some will go to prison. Paul writes here, I know how to be abased. I know what it means to have nothing. And I know how to abound. I know, I know how it feels like to have everything, everywhere. And in all things, I am instructed. Who instructed him? Jesus. Jesus said, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man, me, Jesus, the beloved Jesus, I don't even have a place to lay down my head. That too soon shall be our position. Both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You see that this now, this is where we take the text out of the context we read to each other i can do all things through christ who strengthens me but they don't realize it comes after verse 12. we must learn my friends to be tent makers to be happy with whatever god gives us to not to pursue wealth but to pursue the knowledge of christ the power of his resurrection and 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 step up in following him and to enjoy the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. See, this, this my friend is that's the line that delineates the real from the fraud. Many people want to know Christ, many people want to know the power of his resurrection, but they don't want the persecution. They don't want the suffering. They don't want the shame. They don't want the pain of the fellowship of his sufferings. So you choose. My message ends as this. You're going to get what you choose. God has given you freedom, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, freedom to choose, freedom to worship. No country. No man, no law can take that away from you. You are made in the image of God. And so in the end, you will get what you choose. If you choose riches, you will fall into a snare, and there will be destruction and perdition, and you will pierce yourself with many great sorrows. But if you choose Christ, 
and you make your heavenly treasure the good deeds of love That's where it's at, baby. Don't be like that monkey. Learn the lesson of what Napoleon said. I came in empty. I'm leaving empty. Love your neighbor as Christ has loved you. You'll be misunderstood, but that's okay. And then love God with all your heart, strength, and soul, but above all, with your mind, don't forget, he says to love, we are to love God with all our mind. Long session this morning, but it was necessary because a lot of good questions were raised. And I hope that this was a time of enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, to prepare you for the wonderful challenges ahead of us. Nothing to be afraid of. I'll close at one point. One of the men in our Bible college said, what is the difference between fear and faith? And I had to answer that question. Very educated man, a man who's seen it all. And I said to him, the definition between fear and faith is what you do. Many Christians are talkers, big talkers. Philosophical talkers, in the end, Jesus is going to say, what did you do for me?